This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Sirwa, Michael.Sirwa, S I R O I S dot com. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book One Recalled to Life. Book One, Chapter One The Period. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven, and we were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received, for good or for evil, in the superlative degree of comparison only. There were a king with a large jaw and a queen with a plain face on the throne of England. There were a king with a large jaw and a queen with a fair face on the throne of France. In both countries it was clearer than crystal to the lords of the state preserves of loaves and fishes that things in general were settled for ever. It was the year of our Lord, 1,775. Spiritual revelations were conceded to England at that favoured period, as at this. Mrs. Southcott had recently attained her five-and-twentieth blessed birthday, of whom a prophetic private in the lifeguards had heralded the sublime appearance by announcing that arrangements were made for the swallowing up of London and Westminster. Even the Cock Lane ghost had been laid only a round dozen of years, after wrapping out its messages, as the spirits of this very year last past, supernaturally deficient in originality, wrapped out theirs. Mere messages in the earthly order of events had lately come to the English crown and people, from a congress of British subjects in America, which, strange to relate, have proved more important to the human race than any communications yet received through any of the chickens of the Cock Lane brood. France, less favoured on the whole as to matters spiritual than her sister of the shield and trident, rolled with exceeding smoothness downhill, making paper money and spending it. Under the guidance of her Christian pastors, she entertained herself besides with such humane achievements as sentencing a youth to have his hands cut off, his tongue torn out with pincers, and his body burned alive, because he had not kneeled down in the rain to do honour to a dirty procession of monks which passed within his view at a distance of some fifty or sixty yards. It is likely enough that rooted in the woods of France and Norway there were growing trees, when that sufferer was put to death, already marked by the woodman, fate, to come down and be sawn into boards, to make a certain movable framework, with a sack and a knife in it, terrible in history. It is likely enough that in the rough outhouses of some tillers of the heavy lands adjacent to Paris, there were sheltered from the weather that very day rude carts, bespattered with rustic mire, snuffed about by pigs, and roosted in by poultry, which the farmer, death, had already set apart to be his tumbrils of the revolution. But that woodman and that farmer, though they work unceasingly, work silently, and no one heard them as they went about with muffled tread. The rather forasmuch as to entertain any suspicion that they were awake was to be atheistical and traitorous. In England there was scarcely an amount of order and protection to justify much national boasting. Daring burglaries by armed men and highway robberies took place in the capital itself every night. Families were publicly cautioned not to go out of town without removing their furniture to upholsterers' warehouses for security. The highwayman in the dark was a city tradesman in the light, and, being recognized and challenged by his fellow tradesman, whom he stopped in the character of the captain, gallantly shot him through the head and rode away. The mail was waylaid by seven robbers, and the guard shot three dead, and then got shot himself by the other four, in consequence of the failure of his ammunition, after which the mail was robbed in peace. 
That magnificent potentate, the Lord Mayor of London, was made to stand and deliver on Turnham Green by one highwayman, who despoiled the illustrious creature in sight of all his retinue. Prisoners in London jails fought battles with their turnkeys, and the majesty of the law fired blunderbusses in among them, loaded with rounds of shot and ball. Thieves snipped off diamond crosses from the necks of noble lords at court drawing-rooms. Musketeers went into St. Giles to search for contraband goods, and the mob fired on the musketeers, and the musketeers fired on the mob, and nobody thought any of these occurrences much out of the common way. In the midst of them, the hangman, ever busy and ever worse than useless, was in constant requisition. Now, stringing up long rows of miscellaneous criminals, now hanging a housebreaker on Saturday, who had been taken on Tuesday, now burning people in the hand at Newgate by the dozen, and now burning pamphlets at the door of Westminster Hall, to-day taking the life of an atrocious murderer, and to-morrow of a wretched pilferer who had robbed a farmer's boy of sixpence. All these things, and a thousand like them, came to pass, in and close, upon the dear old year 1,775. Environed by them, while the woodman and the farmer worked unheeded, those two of the large jaws, and those other two of the plain and fair faces, trod with stir enough, and carried their divine rights with a high hand. Thus did the year 1,775 conduct their greatnesses, and myriads of small creatures, the creatures of this chronicle among the rest, along the roads that lay before them. End of Book One Chapter One This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. www.kray.org. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book One. Chapter Two. THE MAIL It was the Dover Road that lay, on a Friday night, late in November, before the first of the persons with whom this history has business. The Dover Road lay, as to him, beyond the Dover Mail, as it lumbered up Shooter's Hill. He walked up hill in the mire by the side of the mail, as the rest of the passengers did, not because they had the least relish for walking exercise, under the circumstances, but because the hill, and the harness, and the mud, and the mail, were all so heavy, that the horses had three times already come to a stop, besides once drawing the coach across the road, with the mutinous intent of taking it back to Blackheath. Reins and whip, and coachman and guard, however, in combination, had read that article of war which forbade a purpose otherwise strongly in favour of the argument, that some brute animals are endued with reason, and the team had capitulated and returned to their duty. With drooping heads and tremulous tails they mashed their way through the thick mud, floundering and stumbling between whiles, as if they were falling to pieces at the larger joints. As often as the driver rested them, and brought them to a stand, with a wary, "'Wo ho! So ho, then!' the near leader violently shook his head and everything upon it, like an unusually emphatic horse, denying that the coach could be got up the hill. Whenever the leader made this rattle, the passenger started, as a nervous passenger might, and was disturbed in mind." There was a steaming mist in all the hollows, and it had roamed in its forlornness up the hill, like an evil spirit, seeking rest and finding none. A clammy and intensely cold mist, it made its slow way through the air in ripples that visibly followed and overspread one another, as the waves of an unwholesome sea might do. It was dense enough to shut out everything from the light of the coach-lamps but these its own workings, and a few yards of road, and the reek of the labouring horses steamed into it, as if they had made it all. 
Two other passengers, besides the one, were plodding up the hill by the side of the mail. All three were wrapped to the cheekbones and over the ears, and wore jack-boots. Not one of the three could have said, from anything he saw, what either of the other two was like, and each was hidden under almost as many wrappers from the eyes of the mind as from the eyes of the body of his two companions. In those days travellers were very shy of being confidential on a short notice, for anybody on the road might be a robber, or in league with robbers. As to the latter, when every posting-house and ale-house could produce somebody in the captain's pay, ranging from the landlord to the lowest stable nondescript, it was the likeliest thing upon the cards. So the guard of the Dover Mail thought to himself— that Friday night in November, one thousand seven hundred and seventy-five, lumbering up Shooter's Hill, as he stood on his own particular perch behind the mail, beating his feet and keeping an eye and a hand on the arm-chest before him, where a loaded blunderbuss lay at the top of six or eight loaded horse-pistols, deposited on a substratum of cutlass. The Dover mail was in its usual genial position that the guard suspected the passengers, the passengers suspected one another and the guard, they all suspected everybody else, and the coachman was sure of nothing but the horses, as to which cattle he could with a clear conscience have taken his oath on the two testaments that they were not fit for the journey. Whoa ho said the coachman. So then— one more pull, and you're at the top and be damned to you, for I have had trouble enough to get you to it. Joe! Hello! the guard replied. What o'clock do you make it, Joe? Ten minutes, good, past eleven. My blood! ejaculated the vexed coachman. And not a top of shooters yet. Tss! Ya! Yeah, get on with you! The emphatic horse, cut short by the whip in a most decided negative, made a decided scramble for it, and the three other horses followed suit. Once more the Dover mail struggled on, with the jack-boots of its passengers squashing along by its side. They had stopped when the coach stopped, and they kept close company with it. If any one of the three had had the hardihood to propose to another to walk on a little ahead into the mist and darkness— he would have put himself in a fair way of getting shot instantly, as a highwayman. The last burst carried the mail to the summit of the hill. The horses stopped to breathe again, and the guard got down to skid the wheel for the descent, and open the coach-door to let the passengers in. "'Tss! Joe!' cried the coachman in a warning voice, looking down from his box. "'What do you say, Tom?' They both listened. I say, a horse at a canter coming up, Joe. I say, a horse at a gallop, Tom, returned the guard, leaving his hold of the door and mounting nimbly to his place. Gentlemen, in the King's name, all of you. With this hurried adjuration he cocked his blunderbuss and stood on the offensive. The passenger booked by this history was on the coach step, getting in. The two other passengers were close behind him and about to follow. He remained on the step, half in the coach and half out of it. They remained in the road below him. They all looked from the coachman to the guard, and from the guard to the coachman, and listened. The coachman looked back, and the guard looked back, and even the emphatic leader pricked up his ears and looked back, without contradicting. The stillness consequent on the cessation of the rumbling and labouring of the coach added to the stillness of the night, made it very quiet indeed. The panting of the horses communicated a tremulous motion to the coach, as if it were in a state of agitation. The hearts of the passengers beat loud enough perhaps to be heard, but at any rate the quiet pause was audibly expressive of people out of breath, and holding the breath, and having the pulses quickened by expectation. The sound of a horse at a gallop came fast and furiously up the hill. "'So ho!' the guard sang out, as loud as he could roar. "'Yo there! Stand! I shall fire!' 
the pace was suddenly checked, and, with much splashing and floundering, a man's voice called from the mist, "'Is that the Dover Mail?' "'Never you mind what it is,' the guard retorted. "'What are you?' "'Is that the Dover Mail?' "'Why do you want to know?' "'I want a passenger, if it is.' "'What passenger?' "'Mr. Jarvis Lorry.' Our booked passenger showed in a moment that it was his name. The guard, the coachman, and the two other passengers eyed him distrustfully. "'Keep where you are,' the guard called to the voice in the mist, "'because, if I should make a mistake, it could never be set right in your lifetime. Gentlemen of the name of Lorry, answer straight.' "'What is the matter?' asked the passenger, then, with mildly quavering speech. "'Who wants me? Is it Jerry?' "'I don't like Jerry's voice, if it is Jerry,' growled the guard to himself. "'He's hoarser than suits me, is Jerry.' "'Yes, Mr. Lorry.' "'What is the matter?' "'A despatch sent after you from over yonder. Tea and company.' "'I know this messenger, guard,' said Mr. Lorry, getting down into the road, assisted from behind more swiftly than politely by the other two passengers, who immediately scrambled into the coach, shut the door, and pulled up the window. "'He may come close. There's nothing wrong.' "'I hope there ain't, but I can't make so nation sure of that,' said the guard, in gruff soliloquy. "'Hallo, you!' "'Well, and hallo, you!' said Jerry, more hoarsely than before. "'Come on at a foot-pace, do you mind me? And if you've got holsters to that saddle yorn, don't let me see your hand go nigh em, for I'm a devil at a quick mistake, and when I make one it takes the form of lead. So now let's look at you.' The figures of a horse and rider came slowly through the eddying mist, and came to the side of the mail, where the passenger stood. The rider stooped, and, casting up his eyes at the guard, handed the passenger a small folded paper. The rider's horse was blown, and both horse and rider were covered with mud, from the hoofs of the horse to the hat of the man. "'Guard,' said the passenger, in a tone of quiet business confidence. The watchful guard, with his right hand at the stock of his raised blunderbuss, his left at the barrel, and his eye on the horseman, answered curtly, Sir? There is nothing to apprehend. I belong to Tellson's Bank. You must know Tellson's Bank in London. I am going to Paris on business. A crown to drink. May I read this? If so be as you're quick, sir. He opened it in the light of the coach-lamp on that side, and read, first to himself, and then aloud, "'Wait at Dover for Mamselle. "'It's not long, you see, guard. "'Jerry, say that my answer was, "'Recalled to life.' "'Jerry started in his saddle. "'That's a blazing strange answer, too,' said he, at his horsest. "'Take that message back, and they will know that I received this, "'as well as if I wrote. "'Make the best of your way. Good night.' With those words the passenger opened the coach-door and got in, not at all assisted by his fellow-passengers, who had expeditiously secreted their watches and purses in their boots, and were now making a general pretense of being asleep. With no more definite purpose than to escape the hazard of originating any other kind of action. The coach lumbered on again, with heavier wreaths of mist closing round it as it began the descent. The guard soon replaced his blunderbuss in his arm-chest, and, having looked to the rest of its contents, and having looked to the supplementary pistols that he wore in his belt, looked to a smaller chest beneath his seat, in which there were a few smith's tools, a couple of torches, and a tinder-box for he was furnished with that completeness that if the coach-lamps had been blown and stormed out, which did occasionally happen, he had only to shut himself up inside, 
keep the flint and steel sparks well off the straw, and get a light with tolerable safety and ease, if he were lucky, in five minutes. Tom! softly over the coach roof. Hello, Joe. Did you hear the message? I did, Joe. What did you make of it, Tom? Nothing at all, Joe. That's a coincidence, too, the guard mused, for I made the same of it myself. Jerry, left alone in the mist and darkness, dismounted meanwhile, not only to ease his spent horse, but to wipe the mud from his face and shake the wet out of his hat brim, which might be capable of holding about half a gallon. After standing with the bridle over his heavily splashed arm until the wheels of the mail were no longer within hearing, and the night was quite still again, he turned to walk down the hill. After that there gallop from Temple Bar, old lady, I won't trust your forelegs till I get you on the level, said this hoarse messenger, glancing at his mare. Recalled to life. That's a blazing strange message. Much of that wouldn't do for you, Jerry. I say, Jerry, you'd be in a blazing bad way, if recalling to life was to come into fashion, Jerry. End of Book One, Chapter Two The Mail Read by Kara Schallenberg on January eleventh, two thousand six, in Oceanside, California. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on January eleventh, two 2006. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens Chapter 3 The Night Shadows a wonderful fact to reflect upon, that every human creature is constituted to be that profound secret and mystery to every other. A solemn consideration, when I enter a great city by night, that every one of those darkly clustered houses encloses its own secret, that every room in every one of them encloses its own secret that every beating heart in the hundreds of thousands of breasts there is, in some of its imaginings, a secret to the heart nearest it. Something of the awfulness, even of death itself, is referable to this. No more can I turn the leaves of this dear book that I loved and vainly hope in time to read it all. No more can I look into the depths of the unfathomable water, wherein, as momentary lights glanced into it, I have had glimpses of buried treasure and other things submerged. It was appointed that the book should shut with a spring for ever and for ever when I had read but a page. It was appointed that the water should be locked in an eternal frost, when the light was playing on its surface, and I stood in ignorance on the shore. My friend is dead, my neighbor is dead, my love, the darling of my soul is dead. It is the inexorable consolation and perpetuation of the secret that was always in that individuality. Burial places of this city, through which I pass, is there a sleeper more inscrutable than its busy inhabitants are in their inmost personality to me, or than I to them? As to this, his natural and not-to-be-alienated inheritance, the messenger on horseback had exactly the same possessions as the king, the first minister of state, or the richest merchant in London. So, with the three passengers shut up in the narrow compasses of one lumbering old mail-coach, they were mysteries to one another, as complete as if each had been in his own coach and six, or his own coach and sixty, with the breadth of a county between him and the next. 
The messenger rode back at an easy trot, stopping pretty often at alehouses by the way to drink, but evincing a tendency to keep his own counsel, and to keep his hat cocked over his eyes. He had eyes that assorted very well with that decoration, being of a surface black with no depth in the color or form, and much too near together, as if they were afraid of being found out in something, singly if they were kept too far apart. They had a sinister expression under an old cocked hat like a three-cornered spittoon, and over a great muffler for the chin and throat which descended nearly to the wearer's knees. When he stopped for a drink, he moved this muffler with his left hand, only while he poured his liquor in with his right. As soon as that was done, he muffled again. "'No, Jerry, no!' said the messenger, harping on one theme as he rode. "'It wouldn't do for you, Jerry. Jerry, you're an honest tradesman. It wouldn't suit your line of business. Recall, bust me if I don't think you've been a-drinkin'. His message perplexed his mind to that degree that he was fain, several times, to take off his hat and scratch his head. Except on the crown, which was raggedly bald, he had stiff black hair standing jaggedly all over it, and growing downhill almost to his broad, blunt nose. It was so like Smith's work, so much like the top of a strongly spiked wall than a head of hair that the best of players at leapfrog might have declined him as the most dangerous man in the world to go over. While he trotted back with the message he was to deliver to the night watchman in his box at the door of Tellison's Bank by Temple Bar, who was to deliver it to greater authorities within, the shadows of the night took such shapes to him as arose out of the message, and took such shapes to the mare as he arose out of her private topics of uneasiness. They seemed to be numerous, for she shied at every shadow on the road. What time the mail-coach lumbered, jolted, rattled, and bumped upon its tedious way with its three fellow-inscrutables inside, to whom, likewise, the shadows of the night revealed themselves in the form of their dozing eyes and wandering thoughts suggested. Telson's bank had run upon it in the mail, as the bank passenger, with an arm drawn through the leathern strap, which did what lay in it to keep him from pounding against the next passenger and driving him into the corner, whenever the coach got a special jolt, nodded in his place with half-shut eyes, the little coach windows and the coach lamp dimly gleaming through them, and the bulky bundle of opposite passenger became the bank, and did a great stroke of business. The rattle of the harness was the chink of money. The more drafts were honored in five minutes than even Telson's, with all its foreign and home connection, ever paid in thrice the time. Then the strong rooms underground at Telson's with such of their valuable stores and secrets as were known to the passenger, and it was not a little that he knew of them, opened before him, and he went in among them with the great keys and the feebly burning candle, and found them safe and strong and sound and still, just as he had last seen them. But, though the bank was almost always with him, and though the coach, in a confused way like the presence of pain under an opiate, was always with him, there was another current of thought that never ceased to run all through the night. He was on his way to dig someone out of a grave. Now, with much of the multitude of faces that showed themselves before him was the true face of the buried person. The shadows of the night did not indicate, but they were all the faces of a man of five and forty by years, and they differed principally in the passions they expressed, and in the ghastliness of their worn and wasted state. Pride, contempt, defiance, stubbornness, submission— lamentation succeeded one another, and did varieties of sunken cheek, cadaverous color, emaciated eyes and figures, 
but the face was in the main one face, and every head was prematurely white. A hundred times the dozing passenger inquired of this spectre, Buried how long? The answer was always the same, almost eighteen years. You had abandoned all hope of being dug out long ago. You knew that you were recalled to life? They tell me so. I hope you care to live. I can't say. Shall I show her to you? Will you come and see her? The answers to this question were various and contradictory. Sometimes the broken reply was, Wait, it would kill me if I saw her too soon. Sometimes it was given in a tender rain of tears, and then it was, Take me to her. Sometimes it was staring and bewildered, and then it was, I don't know her, I don't understand. After such imaginary discourse, the passenger in his fancy would dig and dig and dig, now with a spade, now with a great key, now with his hands to dig this wretched creature out. Got on at last with earth hanging about his face and hair, he would suddenly fan away to dust. The passenger would then start to himself and lower the window to get the reality of mist and rain on his cheek. Yet even when his eyes were opened on the mist and the rain, on that moving patch of light from the lamps and the hedge at the roadside retreating by jerks, the night shadows outside the coach would fall into the train of the night shadows within. The real banking-house by Temple Bar, the real business of the past day, the real strong rooms, the real express sent after him, and the real message returned, would all be there. Out to the midst of them the ghostly face would rise, and he would accost it again. Buried how long? Almost eighteen years. I hope you care to live. I cannot say. Dig, dig dig until an impatient movement from one of the two passengers would admonish him to pull up the window, draw his arms securely through the leathern strap, and speculate upon the two slumbering forms, until his mind lost its hold of them, and they again slid away into the bank and the grave. Buried how long? Almost eighteen years. You had abandoned all hope of being dug out? Long ago. The words were still in his hearing as just spoken, distinctly in his hearing as ever spoken words had been in his life, when the weary passenger started to the consciousness of daylight, and found that the shadows of night were gone. He lowered the window, and looked out at the rising sun. There was a ridge of ploughed land, with a plough upon it, where it had been left last night when the horses were unyoked beyond a quiet coppice-wood, in which many leaves of burning red and golden yellow still remained upon the trees. Though the earth was cold and wet, the sky was clear, and the sun rose, bright, placid, and beautiful. Eighteen years,' said the passenger, looking at the sun. "'Gracious creator of day, to be buried alive for eighteen years. Thus ends chapter 3, The Night Shadows. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on January eleventh, two 2006. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. CHAPTER Four, THE PREPARATION When the mail got successfully to Dover in the course of the forenoon, the head drawer at the Royal George Hotel opened the coach door, as his custom was. He did it with some flourish of ceremony, for a mail journey from London in winter was an achievement to congratulate an adventurous traveller upon. 
By that time there was only one adventurous traveller left to be congratulated, for the other two had been set down at their respective roadside destinations. The mildewy inside of the coach, with its damp and dirty straw, its disagreeable smell, and its obscurity, was rather like a larger dog-kennel. Mr. Lorry, the passenger, shaking himself out of it in chains of straw, a tangle of shaggy wrapper, flapping hat, and muddy legs, was rather like a larger sort of dog. "'There will be a packet to Calais to-morrow, drawer?' "'Yes, sir, if the weather holds, and the wind sets tolerable fair. The tide'll serve pretty nicely at about two in the afternoon, sir. Bed, sir? I shall not go to bed until night, but I want a bedroom, and a barber.' "'And then breakfast, sir. Yes, sir. That way, sir, if you please. Show Concord. Gentlemen's valise are not wanted to Concord. Pull off the gentlemen's boots in Concord. You'll find a fine sea-coal fire, sir. Fetch barber to Concord. Stir about there now for Concord.' The Concord bedchamber being always assigned to a passenger by the mail, and passengers by the mail being always heavily wrapped up from head to foot, the room had the odd interest for the establishment of the Royal George that, although but one kind of man was seen to go into it, all kinds and varieties of men came out of it. Consequently, another drawer, and two porters, and several maids, and the landlady were all loitering, by accident, at various points of the road between the Concord and the coffee-room, when a gentleman of sixty, formally dressed in a brown suit of clothes, pretty well worn, but very well kept, with large square cuffs and large flaps to the pockets, passed along on his way to his breakfast. The coffee-room had no other occupant that forenoon other than the gentleman in brown. His breakfast-table was drawn before the fire, and he sat with its light shining on him, waiting for the meal. He sat so still that he might have been sitting for his portrait. Very orderly and methodical he looked, with a hand on each knee, and a loud watch ticking a sonorous sermon under his flapped waistcoat, as though it pitted its gravity and longevity against the levity and evanescence of the brisk fire. He had a good leg, and was a little vain of it, for his brown stockings fitted sleek and close, and were of a fine texture. His shoes and buckles, too, though plain, were trim. He wore an odd little sleek, crisp, flaxen wig, setting very close to his head, which wig, it is to be presumed, was made of hair, but which looked far more as though it were spun from filaments of silk or glass. His linen, though not of a fineness in accordance with his stockings, was as white as the tops of the waves that broke upon the neighboring beach or the specks of sail that glinted in the sunlight far out at sea. A face habitually suppressed and quieted was still lighted up under the quaint wig by a pair of moist bright eyes that it must have cost their owner in years gone by some pains to drill to the composed and reserved expression of Telson's bank. He had a healthy color in his cheeks and his face, though lined, bore few traces of anxiety, but perhaps the confidential bachelor clerks in Telson's bank were principally occupied with the cares of other people, and perhaps second-hand cares, like second-hand clothes, came easily off and on. Completing his resemblance to a man who was sitting for his portrait, Mr. Lorry dropped off to sleep. The arrival of his breakfast roused him, and he said to the drawer, as he moved his chair to it, "'I wish accommodation prepared for a young lady who may come here at any time to-day. She may ask for Mr. Jarvis Lorry, or she may only ask for a gentleman from Telson's Bank. Please to let me know.' "'Yes, sir. Telson's Bank in London, sir?' "'Yes. Yes, sir. We oftentimes the honour to entertain your gentlemen in their travelling backwards and forwards betwixt London and Paris, sir.' A vast dealing of travelling, sir, in Telson and Company's house. Yes, we are quite a French house, as well as an English one. Yes, sir. Not much in the habit of travelling yourself, I think, sir. Not in late years. It is fifteen years since we, well, since I came last from France. Indeed, sir. I was before my time here, sir. 
before our people's time here, sir. The George was in other hands at that time, sir. I believe so. But I could hold a pretty wager, sir, that a house like Telson and Company was flourishing a matter of fifty, not to speak of fifteen years ago. You might say treble that, and say a hundred and fifty, and yet not be far from the truth. Indeed, sir! Rounding his mouth and both his eyes, as he stepped backward from the table, the waiter shifted his napkin from his right arm to his left, dropped into a comfortable attitude, and stood surveying the guest while he ate and drank, as from an observatory or watchtower, according to the immemorial usage of waiters in all ages. When Mr. Lorry had finished his breakfast, he went out for a stroll on the beach. The little, narrow, crooked town of Dover hid itself away from the beach, and ran its head into the chalk cliffs like a marine ostrich. The beach was a desert of heaps of sea and stones tumbling wildly about, and the sea did what it liked, and what it liked was destruction. It thundered at the town, and thundered at the cliffs, and brought the coast down madly. The air among the houses was of so strong a piscatory flavor that one might have supposed sick fish went up to be dipped into it, as sick people went down to be dipped into the sea. A little fishing was done in the port, and a quantity of strolling about by night and looking seaward, particularly at that times when the tide made and was near flood. Small tradesmen, who did no business whatever, sometimes unaccountably realized large fortunes, and it was remarkable that nobody in the neighborhood could endure a lamplighter. As the day declined into the afternoon and the air, which had been at intervals clear enough to allow the French coast to be seen, became again charged with mist and vapor, Mr. Lorry's thoughts seemed to cloud too. When it was dark, and he sat before the coffee-room fire awaiting his dinner as he had awaited his breakfast, his mind was busily digging, digging, digging in the live red coals. A bottle of good claret after dinner does a digger in the red coals no harm, otherwise then, as it has a tendency to throw him out of work. Mr. Lorry had been idle a long time and had just poured out his last glassful of wine with as complete an appearance of satisfaction as is ever to be found in an elderly gentleman of a fresh complexion who has got to the end of a bottle, when a rattling of wheels came up the narrow street and rumbled into the inn-yard. He set down his glass untouched. "'This is Mademoiselle,' said he. In a very few minutes the waiter came in to announce that Miss Manette had arrived from London and would be happy to see the gentleman from Telson's. So soon. Miss Manette had taken some refreshment on the road and required none then, and was extremely anxious to see the gentleman from Telson's immediately, if it suited his pleasure and convenience. The gentleman from Telson's had nothing left for it but to empty his glass with an air of stolid desperation settle his odd little flaxen wig at his ears, and follow the waiter to Miss Manette's apartment. It was a large, dark room, furnished in a funereal manner with black horsehair and loaded with heavy, dark tables. These had been oiled and oiled until the two tall candles on the table in the middle of the room were gloomily reflected on every leaf, as if they were buried in deep graves of black mahogany, and no light to speak of could be expected from them until they were dug out. The obscurity was so difficult to penetrate that Mr. Lorry, picking his way over the well-worn turkey carpet, supposed Miss Manette to be, for the moment, in some adjacent room, until, having got past the two tall candles he saw, standing to receive him by the table between him and the fire, a young lady of not more than seventeen, in a riding-cloak, and still holding her straw travelling hat by its ribbon in her hand. As his eyes rested on a short, slight, pretty figure, 
a quantity of golden hair, a pair of blue eyes that met his own with an inquiring look, and the forehead with a singular capacity, remembering how young and smooth it was, of rifting and knitting itself into an expression that was not quite one of perplexity, or wonder, or alarm, or merely a bright fixed attention, though it included all four expressions. As his eyes rested on these things, a sudden vivid likeness passed before him, of a child whom he had held in his arms on a passage across that very channel one cold time, when the hail drifted heavily and the sea ran high. The likeness passed away, like a breath along the surface of the gaunt pier-glass behind her, on the frame which a hospital procession of negro cupids, several headless and all cripples, were offering black baskets of dead sea fruit to black divinities of the feminine gender, and he made his formal bow to Miss Manette. "'Pray take a seat, sir,' in a very clear and pleasant young voice, a little foreign in its accent, but a very little indeed. "'I kiss your hand, miss,' said Mr. Lorry, with the manners of an earlier date, as he made his formal bow again, and took his seat. "'I received a letter from the bank, sir, yesterday, informing me that some intelligence or discovery—the word is not material, miss, either word will do—respecting the small property of my poor father, whom I never saw, so long dead—' Mr. Lorry moved in his chair and cast a troubled look toward the hospital procession of negro cupids, as if they had any help for anybody in their absurd baskets. Rendered it necessary that I should go to Paris, there to communicate with the gentleman of the bank so good as to be dispatched to Paris for the purpose. Myself. As I was prepared to hear, sir. She curtsied to him. Young ladies made curtsies these days with a pretty desire to convey to him that she felt how much older and wiser he was than she. He made her another bow. I replied to the bank, sir, that it was considered necessary by those who know that, and who are so kind as to advise me, that I should go to France, and that as I am an orphan and have no friend who could go with me, I should esteem it highly if I might be permitted to place myself during the journey under that worthy gentleman's protection. The gentleman had left London, but I think a messenger was sent after him to beg the favour of his waiting for me here. I was happy, said Mr. Lorry, to be entrusted with the charge. I shall be more happy to execute it. Sir, I thank you indeed. I thank you very gratefully. It was told me by the bank that the gentleman would explain to me the details of the business, and that I must prepare myself to find them of a surprising nature. I have done my best to prepare myself, and I naturally have a strong and eager interest to know what they are. Naturally, said Mr. Lorry. Yes, I... After a pause he added, again settling his crisp flaxen wig at the ears, It is very difficult to begin. He did not begin, but in his indecision met her glance. The young forehead lifted itself into that singular expression, but it was pretty and uncharacteristic besides being singular, and she raised her hand as if with some involuntary action she caught at or stayed some passing shadow. "'Are you quite a stranger to me, sir?' Am I not? Mr. Lorry opened his hands and extended them outwards with an argumentative smile. Between the eyebrows and just over the little feminine nose, the line of which was as delicate and fine as it could possibly be, the expression deepened itself as she took her seat thoughtfully in the chair by which she had thitherto remained standing. He watched her as she mused, and the moment she raised her eye again, went on. In your adopted country, I presume, I cannot do better than address you as a young English lady, Miss Manette? If you please, sir. 
Miss Manette, I am a man of business. I have a business charge to equip myself of. In your reception of it, don't heed me any more than if I were a speaking machine. Truly, I am not much else. I will, with your leave, relate to you, miss, the story of one of our customers. Story? He seemed willfully to mistake the word she had repeated, when he added, in a hurry, Yes, customers. In the banking business we usually call our connection our customers. He was a French gentleman, a scientific gentleman, a man of great acquirements, a doctor. Not of Beauvais. Why, yes, of Beauvais. Like Monsieur Manette, your father, the gentleman was of Beauvais. Like Monsieur Manette, your father, the gentleman was of repute in Paris. I had the honor of knowing him there. Our relations were business relations, but confidential. I was at that time in our French house, and had been, oh, twenty years. At this time, may I ask, at, at what time, sir? I speak, miss, of twenty years ago. He married, an English lady, and I was one of the trustees. His affairs, like the affairs of many other French gentlemen and French families, were entirely in Telson's hands. In a similar way, I am, or have been, trustee of one or another to scores of our customers. These are mere business relations, miss. There is no friendship in them, no particular interest, nothing like sentiment. I have passed from one to another in the course of my business life, just as I pass from one of our customers to another in the course of my business day. In short, I have no feelings. I am a mere machine. To go on. But this is my father's story, sir, and I begin to think— The curiously roughened forehead was very intent upon him. That when I was left an orphan, through my mother's surviving my father only two years, it was you who brought me to England. I am almost sure it was you. Mr. Lorry took the hesitating little hand that confidently advanced to take his, and he put it with some ceremony to his lips. He then conducted the young lady straight away to the chair again, and, holding the chair back with his left hand, and using his right by turns to rub his chin, pull his wig at the ears, or point what he said stood looking down into her face, while she sat looking up into his. Miss Manette, it was I. And you will see how truly I spoke of myself just now in saying I had no feelings, that all the relationship I hold with my fellow creatures are mere business relations, when you reflect that I have never seen you since. No, you have been a ward of Telson's house since, and I have been busy with the other business of Telson's house since. Feelings? I have no time for them, no chance of them. I pass my whole life, miss, in turning an immense pecuniary mangle. After this odd description of his daily routine of employment, Mr. Lorry flattened his flaxen wig upon his head with both hands, which was most unnecessary, for nothing could be flatter than its shining surface was before, and resumed his former attitude. So far, miss, as you have remarked, this is the story of your regretted father. Now comes the difference. If your father had not died when he did, don't be frightened. How you start? She did indeed start, and she caught his wrists with both her hands. Pray, said Mr. Lorry, in a soothing tone, bringing his left hand from back of the chair to lay it upon the supplicatory fingers that clasped him in so violent a tremble, pray control your agitation. A matter of business. As I was saying, her look so decomposed him that he stopped, wandered, and began anew. As I was saying, if Monsieur Manette had not died, if he had not suddenly and silently disappeared, if he had not been spirited away, if it had not been difficult to guess to what dreadful place, though no art could trace him, if he had an enemy and some compatriot who could exercise a privilege that I in my own time have known the boldest people afraid to speak of in a whisper across the water there, 
for instance, the privilege of filling up blank forms for the consignment of any one to the oblivion of a prison for any length of time. If his wife had implored the king, the queen, the court, the clergy for any tidings of him, and all quite in vain, then the history of your father would have been the history of this unfortunate gentleman, the doctor of Beauvais. I entreat you to tell me more, sir. I will. I am going to. Can you bear it? I can bear anything but the uncertainty you leave me in at this moment. You speak collectedly, and you are collected, that's good, though his manner was less satisfied than his words. A matter of business. Regard it as a matter of business, business that must be done. Now, if this doctor's wife, though a lady of great courage and spirit, had suffered so intensively from this cause before her little child was born, the little child was a daughter, sir. A daughter. A, a matter of business. Don't be distressed, miss. If the poor lady had suffered so intently before her little child was born, that she came to the determination of sparing the poor child the inheritance of any part of the agony she had known the pains of, by rearing her in the belief that her father was dead, no, don't kneel. In heaven's name, why should you kneel to me? For the truth. Oh, dear, good, compassionate sir, for the truth. Ah, a matter of business. You confuse me, and how can I transact business if I am confused? Let us be clear-headed. If you could kindly mention now, for instance, what nine times nine pence are, or how many shillings and twenty guineas, it would be so encouraging. I should be so much more at my ease about your state of mind. Without directly answering to this appeal, she sat so still then that, when he had gently raised her, and the hands that had not ceased to clasp his wrists were so much more steady than they had been, that she communicated some reassurance to Mr. Jarvis Lorry. That's right, that's right. Courage, business. You have business before you, useful business. Miss Manette, your mother took this course with you, and when she died, I believe broken-hearted, having never slackened her unavailing search for your father, she left you at two years old to grow to be blooming, beautiful, and happy without the dark cloud upon you of living in uncertainty where your father soon wore his heart out in prison, or wasted there through many lingering years. As he said the words, he looked down with an admiring pity on the flowing golden hair, as if he pictured to himself that it might have been already tinged with grey. You know that your parents had no great possession, and that what they had was secured to your mother and to you. There has been no new discovery of money or any other property, but— He felt his wrist held closer— and he stopped. The expression in the forehead which had so particularly attracted his notice, and which was now immovable, had deepened into one of pain and horror. But he has been, been found. He is alive, greatly changed. It is too probable, almost a wreck. It is possible though we will hope the best, still alive. Your father has been taken to the house of an old servant in Paris, and we are going there, I, to identify him, if I can, you to restore him to life, love, duty, rest, comfort. A shiver ran through her frame, and from it through his she said in a low, distinct, awe-stricken voice, as if she were saying it in a dream. I am going to see his ghost. It will be his ghost, not him. Mr. Lorry quietly chafed the hands that held his arm. There, 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 see now, see now. The best and the worst are known to you now. You are well on your way to the poor wronged gentleman, and, with a fair sea voyage and a fair land journey, you will soon be at his dear side. 
She repeated in the same tone, sunk to a whisper, I have been free. I have been happy, yet this ghost has never haunted me. Only one thing more, said Mr. Lorry, laying stress upon it as a wholesome means of enforcing her attentions. He has been found under another name, his own long forgotten or long concealed. It would be worse than useless now to inquire which, worse than useless to seek to know whether he has been for years overlooked or always designedly held prisoner. It would be worse than useless now to make any inquiries, because it would be dangerous. Better not to mention the subject, anywhere or in any way, and to remove him, for a while at all events, out of France. Even I, safe as an Englishman, and even Telson's, important as they are to French credit, avoid all naming of the matter. I carry about me not a scrap of writing openly referring to it. This is a secret service altogether. My credentials, entries, and memoranda are all comprehended in the one line, Recalled to life, which may mean anything. But what is the matter? She doesn't notice a word. Miss Manette! Perfectly still and silent, not even fallen back in her chair, she sat under his hand, utterly insensible, with her eyes open and fixed upon him, and with that last expression looking as if were carved or branded on her forehead. So close was her hold upon his arm that he feared to detach himself lest he should hurt her. Therefore he called out loudly for assistance without moving. A wild-looking woman, whom even in his agitation Mr. Lorry observed to be all of a red color, and to have red hair, and to be dressed in some extraordinarily tight-fitting fashion, and to have on her head a most wonderful bonnet, like a grenadier wooden measure, and good measure, too, or a great Stilton cheese, came running into the room in advance of the inn-servants, and soon settled the question of his detachment from the poor young lady by laying a brawny hand upon his chest and sending him flying back against the nearest wall. "'I really think this must be a man,' was Mr. Lorry's breathless reflection, simultaneously with his coming up against the wall. "'Why, look at you all!' bawled this figure, addressing the inn-servants. Why don't you go and fetch things instead of standing there staring at me? I am not so much to look at, am I? Why not you go and fetch the thing? I'll let you know, if you don't bring smelling salts, cold water, and vinegar, quick I will. There was an immediate dispersal for these restoratives, and she softly laid the patient on a sofa, and tended her with great skill and gentleness, calling her, My precious, and my bird, and spreading her golden hair aside over her shoulders with great pride and care. "'And you in brown,' she said indignantly, turning to Mr. Lorry. "'Couldn't you tell her what you had to tell her without frightening her to death? Look at her, with a pretty pale face and her cold hands. Do you call that being a banker?' Mr. Lorry was so exceedingly disconcerted by a question so hard to answer, that he could only look on, at a distance, with much feebler sympathy and humility, while the strong woman, having banished the inn-servants under the mysterious penalty of letting them know, something not mentioned if they stayed there, staring, recovered her charge by a regular series of gradations, and coaxed her to lay her drooping head upon her shoulder. "'I hope she will be well now,' said Mr. Lorry. No thanks to you in brown, if she does, my darling pretty. I hope, said Mr. Lorry, after another pause of feeble sympathy and humility, that you accompany Miss Manette to France. A likely thing, too, replied the young woman. If it was ever intended that I should go across salt water, do you suppose Providence would have cast my lot up on an island? This being another question hard to answer, Mr. Jarvis Lorry withdrew to consider it. Thus ends Chapter 4, The Preparation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to find out how you can volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book One, Chapter Five The Wine Shop. A large cask of wine had been dropped and broken in the street. The accident had happened in getting it out of a cart. The cask had tumbled out with a run, the hoops had burst, and it lay on the stones just outside the door of the wine shop, shattered like a walnut shell. All the people within reach had suspended their business or their idleness to run to the spot and drink the wine. The rough, irregular stones of the street, pointing every way and designed, one might have thought, expressly to lame all living creatures that approached them, had dammed it into little pools. These were surrounded, each by its own jostling group or crowd, according to its size. Some men knelt down, made scoops of their two hands joined, and sipped, or tried to help women who bent over their shoulders to sip, before the wine had all run out between their fingers. Others, men and women, dipped in the puddles with little mugs of mutilated earthenware, or even with handkerchiefs from women's heads, which were squeezed dry into infants' mouths. Others made small mud embankments to stem the wine as it ran. Others, directed by lookers-on up at high windows, darted here and there to cut off little streams of wine that started away in new directions. Others devoted themselves to the sodden and lee-dyed pieces of the cask, licking and even champing the moister wine-rotted fragments with eager relish. There was no drainage to carry off the wine, and not only did it all get taken up, but so much mud got taken up along with it, that there might have been a scavenger in the street, if any one acquainted with it could have believed in such a miraculous presence. A shrill sound of laughter, and of amused voices, voices of men, women, and children, resounded in the street while this wine-game lasted. There was little roughness in it, in the sport, and much playfulness. There was a special companionship in it, an observable inclination on the part of every one to join some other one which led, especially among the luckier or lighter-hearted, to frolicsome embraces, drinking of healths, shaking of hands, and even joining of hands, and dancing a dozen together. When the wine was gone, and the places where it had been most abundant were raked into a gridiron pattern by fingers, these demonstrations ceased as suddenly as they had broken out. The man who had left his saw sticking in the firewood he was cutting set it in motion again. The woman, who had left on a doorstep the little pot of hot ashes, at which she had been trying to soften the pain in her own starved fingers and toes, or those of her child, returned to it. Men with bare arms, matted locks, and cadaverous faces, who had emerged into the winter light from cellars, moved away to descend again, and a gloom gathered on the scene that appeared more natural to it than sunshine. The wine was red wine and had stained the ground of the narrow street in the suburb of St. Antoine in Paris, where it was spilled. It had stained many hands, too, and many faces, and many naked feet, and many wooden shoes. The hands of the man who sawed the wood left red marks on the billets, and the forehead of the woman who nursed her baby was stained with the stain of the old rag she wound about her head again. Those who had been greedy with the staves of the cask had acquired a tigerish smear about the mouth, and one tall joker, so besmirched, his head more out of a long, squalid bag of a nightcap than in it, scrawled upon a wall with his finger dipped in muddy wine lees. Blood! The time was to come when that wine, too, would be spilt on the street stones, and when the stain of it would be red upon many there. And now that the cloud had settled on St. Antoine, which a momentary gleam had driven from his sacred countenance, the darkness of it was heavy. Cold, dirt, sickness, ignorance, and want were the lords in waiting on the saintly presence, nobles of great power, all of them, but most especially the last. Samples of a people that had undergone a terrible grinding and regrinding in the mill, and certainly not in the fabulous mill which ground old people young, shivered at every corner, passed in and out of every doorway, looked from every window, fluttered in every vestige of a garment that the wind shook. The mill which had worked them down was the mill that grinds young people old. The children had ancient faces and grave voices. 
and upon them, and upon the grown faces, and ploughed into every furrow of age and coming up afresh, was the sign, Hunger. It was prevalent everywhere. Hunger was pushed out of the tall houses, in the wretched clothing that hung upon poles and lines. Hunger was patched into them with straw and rag and wood and paper. Hunger was repeated in every fragment of the small modicum of firewood that the man sawed off. Hunger stared down from the smokeless chimneys, and started up from the filthy street that had no offal among its refuse of anything to eat. Hunger was the inscription on the baker's shelves, written in every small loaf of his scanty stock of bad bread, at the sausage-shop, in every dead dog preparation that was offered for sale. Hunger rattled its dry bones among the roasting chestnuts in the turned cylinder. Hunger was shred into atomies in every farthing porringer of husky chips of potato, fried with some reluctant drops of oil. Its abiding place was in all things fitted to it, a narrow winding street, full of offence and stench, with other narrow winding streets diverging, all peopled by rags and nightcaps, and all smelling of rags and nightcaps, and all visible things with a brooding look upon them that looked ill. In the hunted air of the people there was yet some wild beast thought of the possibility of turning at bay. Depressed and slinking though they were, eyes of fire were not wanting among them, nor compressed lips, white with what they suppressed, nor foreheads knitted into the likeness of the gallows-rope they mused about enduring, or inflicting. The trade signs, and they were almost as many as the shops, were all grim illustrations of want. The butcher and the porkman painted up only the leanest scrags of meat, the baker the coarsest of meagre loaves. The people, rudely pictured as drinking in the wine-shops, croaked over their scanty measures of thin wine and beer, and were gloweringly confidential together. Nothing was represented in a flourishing condition, save tools and weapons. But the cutler's knives and axes were sharp and bright, the smith's hammers were heavy, and the gunmaker's stock was murderous. The crippling stones of the pavement, with their many little reservoirs of mud and water, had no footways, but broke off abruptly at the doors. The kennel, to make amends, ran down the middle of the street, when it ran at all, which was only after heavy rains, and then it ran, by many eccentric fits, into the houses. Across the streets at wide intervals, one clumsy lamp was slung by a rope and pulley. At night, when the lamplighter had let these down, and lighted and hoisted them again, a feeble grove of dim wicks swung in a sickly manner overhead, as if they were at sea. Indeed they were at sea and the ship and the crew were in peril of tempest. For the time was to come when the gaunt scarecrows of that region should have watched the lamplighter in their idleness and hunger so long as to conceive the idea of improving on his method, and hauling up men by those ropes and pulleys to flare upon the darkness of their condition. But the time was not come yet, and every wind that blew over France shook the rags of the scarecrows in vain for the birds, fine of song and feather, took no warning. The wine-shop was a corner-shop, better than most others in its appearance and degree, and the master of the wine-shop had stood outside it in a yellow waistcoat and green breeches, looking on at the struggle for the lost wine. "'It's not my affair,' said he, with a final shrug of the shoulders. "'The people from the market did it. Let them bring another.' There his eyes happened to catch the tall joker writing up his joke, so he called to him across the way. "'Say then, my Gaspard, what do you do there?' The fellow pointed to his joke with immense significance, as is often the way with his tribe. It missed its mark, and completely failed, as is often the way with his tribe too. "'What now? Are you a subject for the mad hospital?' said the wine-shopkeeper, crossing the road and obliterating the jest with a handful of mud, "'picked up for the purpose, and smeared over it. "'Why do you write in the public streets? "'Is there, tell me thou, is there no other place to write such words in?' "'In his expostulation he dropped his cleaner hand, "'perhaps accidentally, perhaps not, upon the joker's heart. "'The joker wrapped it with his own, took a nimble spring upward, "'and came down in a fantastic dancing attitude, 
with one of his stained shoes jerked off his foot into his hand and held out. A joker of an extremely, not to say wolfishly practical character, he looked under those circumstances. "'Put it on, put it on,' said the other. "'Call wine, wine, and finish there.' With that advice he wiped his soiled hand upon the joker's dress, such as it was, quite deliberately, as having dirted the hand on his account, and then recrossed the road and entered the wine-shop. The wine-shop-keeper was a bull-necked, martial-looking man of thirty, and he should have been of a hot temperament, for although it was a bitter day, he wore no coat, but carried one slung over his shoulder. His shirt-sleeves were rolled up, too, and his brown arms were bare to the elbows. Neither did he wear anything more on his head than his own crisply curling short dark hair. He was a dark man altogether, with good eyes and a good bold breadth between them. Good-humoured looking on the whole, but implacable looking, too, evidently a man of strong resolution and a set purpose, a man not desirable to be met rushing down a narrow pass with a gulf on either side, for nothing would turn the man. Madame Defarge, his wife, sat in the shop behind the counter as he came in. Madame Defarge was a stout woman of about his own age, with a watchful eye that seldom seemed to look at anything, a large hand, heavily ringed, a steady face, strong features, and great composure of manner. There was a character about Madame Defarge, from which one might have predicated that she did not often make mistakes against herself in any of the reckonings over which she presided. Madame Defarge, being sensitive to cold, was wrapped in fur, and had a quantity of bright shawl twined about her head, though not to the concealment of her large earrings. Her knitting was before her, but she had laid it down to pick her teeth with a toothpick. Thus engaged, with her right elbow supported by her left hand, Madame Defarge said nothing when her lord came in, but coughed just one grain of cough. This, in combination with the lifting of her darkly defined eyebrows over her toothpick by the breadth of a line, suggested to her husband that he would do well to look round the shop among the customers, for any new customer who had dropped in while he stepped over the way. The wine-shopkeeper accordingly rolled his eyes about until they rested upon an elderly gentleman and a young lady, who were seated in a corner. Other company were there, two playing cards, two playing dominoes, three standing by the counter, lengthening out a short supply of wine. As he passed behind the counter, he took notice that the elderly gentleman said in a look to the young lady, "'This is our man.' "'What the devil do you do in that gallery there?' said M. Defarge to himself. "'I don't know you.' But he feigned not to notice the two strangers, and fell into discourse with the triumvirate of customers who were drinking at the counter. "'How goes it, Jacques?' said one of these three to M. Defarge. "'Is all the spilt wine swallowed?' "'Every drop, Jacques,' answered M. Defarge. When this interchange of Christian names was effected, Madame Defarge, picking her teeth with her toothpick, coughed another grain of cough, and raised her eyebrows by the breadth of another line. "'It is not often,' said the second of the three, addressing Monsieur Defarge, "'that many of these miserable beasts know the taste of wine, or of anything but black bread and death. Is it not so, Jacques?' "'It is so, Jacques,' Monsieur Defarge returned. At this second interchange of the Christian name, Madame Defarge, still using her toothpick with profound composure, coughed another grain of cough, and raised her eyebrows by the breadth of another line. The last of the three now said his say, as he put down his empty drinking-vessel, and smacked his lips. "'Ah, so much the worse! A bitter taste it is that such poor cattle always have in their mouths, and hard lives they live, Jacques. Am I right, Jacques?' "'You are right, Jacques.' was the response of Monsieur Defarge. The third interchange of the Christian name was completed at the moment when Madame Defarge put her toothpick by, kept her eyebrows up, and slightly rustled in her seat. "'Hold, then, true,' muttered her husband. "'Gentlemen, my wife.' The three customers pulled off their hats to Madame Defarge with three flourishes. She acknowledged their homage by bending her head and giving them a quick look. Then she glanced in a casual manner round the wine-shop, 
took up her knitting with great apparent calmness and repose of spirit, and became absorbed in it. "'Gentlemen,' said her husband, who had kept his bright eye observantly upon her, "'good day. The chamber, furnished bachelor fashion, that you wished to see, and were inquiring for when I stepped out, is on the fifth floor. The doorway of the staircase gives on to the little courtyard close to the left here.' pointing with his hand, near to the window of my establishment. But now that I remember, one of you has already been there, and can show the way. Gentlemen, adieu. They paid for their wine, and left the place. The eyes of Monsieur Defarge were studying his wife at her knitting, when the elderly gentleman advanced from his corner, and begged the favour of a word. Willingly, sir, said Monsieur Defarge, and quietly stepped with him to the door. Their conference was very short, but very decided. Almost at the first word, M. Defarge started, and became deeply attentive. It had not lasted a minute, when he nodded and went out. The gentleman then beckoned to the young lady, and they too went out. Madame Defarge knitted with nimble fingers and steady eyebrows, and saw nothing. Mr. Jarvis Lorry and Miss Manette, emerging from the wine-shop thus, joined M. Defarge in the doorway to which he had directed his other company just before. It opened from a stinking little black courtyard, and was the general public entrance to a great pile of houses, inhabited by a great number of people. In the gloomy tile-paved entry to the gloomy tile-paved staircase, M. Defarge bent down on one knee to the child of his old master, and put her hand to his lips. It was a gentle action but not at all gently done. A very remarkable transformation had come over him in a few seconds. He had no good humour in his face, nor any openness of aspect left, but had become a secret, angry, dangerous man. It is very high. It is a little difficult. Better to begin slowly. Thus M. Defarge, in a stern voice to Mr. Lorry, as they began ascending the stairs. "'Is he alone?' the latter whispered. "'Alone? God help him who should be with him,' said the other, in the same low voice. "'Is he always alone, then?' "'Yes.' "'Of his own desire?' "'Of his own necessity, as he was when I first saw him after they found me, and demanded to know if I would take him, and that my peril be discreet. As he was then, so he is now.' "'He is greatly changed?' "'Changed.' The keeper of the wine-shop stopped to strike the wall with his hand, and mutter a tremendous curse. No direct answer could have been half so forcible. Mr. Lorry's spirits grew heavier and heavier, as he and his two companions ascended higher and higher. Such a staircase, with its accessories, in the older and more crowded parts of Paris, would be bad enough now. But at that time it was vile indeed to unaccustomed and unhardened senses. Every little habitation within the great foul nest of one high building, that is to say, the room or rooms within every door that opened on the general staircase, left its own heap of refuse on its own landing, besides flinging other refuse from its own windows. The uncontrollable and hopeless mass of decomposition so engendered would have polluted the air, even if poverty and deprivation had not loaded it with their intangible impurities. The two bad sources combined to make it almost insupportable. Through such an atmosphere, by a steep dark shaft of dirt and poison, the way lay. Yielding to his own disturbance of mind, and to his young companion's agitation, which became greater every instant, Mr. Jarvis Lorry twice stopped the rest. Each of these stoppages was made at a doleful grating, by which any languishing good airs that were left uncorrupted seemed to escape, and all spoilt and sickly vapours seemed to crawl in. Through the rusted bars, tastes rather than glimpses were caught of the jumbled neighbourhood, and nothing within range, nearer or lower than the summits of the two great towers of Notre Dame, had any promise on it of healthy life or wholesome aspirations. At last the top of the staircase was gained, and they stopped for the third time. There was yet an upper staircase of a steeper inclination and of contracted dimensions to be ascended before the garret story was reached. The keeper of the wine-shop, 
always going a little in advance, and always going on the side which Mr. Lorry took, as though he dreaded to be asked any question by the young lady, turned himself about here, and carefully feeling in the pockets of the coat he carried over his shoulder, took out a key. "'The door is locked, then, my friend?' said Mr. Lorry, surprised. "'Eh, hey, yes,' was the grim reply of M. Defarge. "'You think it necessary to keep the unfortunate gentleman so retired?' "'I think it necessary to turn the key,' M. Defarge whispered it closer in his ear, and frowned heavily. "'Why? Why? Because he has lived so long locked up that he would be frightened, rave, tear himself to pieces, die, come to I know not what harm if his door was left open?' "'Is it possible?' exclaimed Mr. Lorry. "'Is it possible?' repeated Defarge bitterly. "'Yes, and a beautiful world we live in when it is possible, and when many other such things are possible, and not only possible but done, done, see you, under that sky there every day. Long live the devil. Let us go on.' This dialogue had been held in so very low a whisper that not a word of it had reached the young lady's ears. But by this time she trembled under such strong emotion— and her face expressed such deep anxiety, and above all such dread and terror, that Mr. Lorry felt it incumbent on him to speak a word or two of reassurance. "'Courage, dear miss, courage! Business! The worst will be over in a moment. It is but passing the room-door, and the worst is over. Then all the good you bring to him, all the relief, all the happiness you bring to him, begin. Let our good friend here assist you on that side.' "'That's well, friend Defarge. Come now. Business, business.' They went up, slowly and softly. The staircase was short, and they were soon at the top. There, as it had an abrupt turn in it, they came all at once in sight of three men, whose heads were bent down close together at the side of a door, and who were intently peering into the room to which the door belonged, through some chinks or holes in the wall. On hearing footsteps close at hand— these three turned and rose, and showed themselves to be the three of one name, who had been drinking in the wine-shop. "'I forgot them in the surprise of your visit,' explained M. Defarge. "'Leave us, good boys. We have the business here.' The three glided by, and went silently down. There appearing to be no other door on that floor, and the keeper of the wine-shop going straight to this one when they were left alone, Mr. Lorry asked him in a whisper, with a little anger, do you make a show of Monsieur Manette? I show him in the way you have seen to a chosen few. Is that well? I think it is well. Who are the few? How do you choose them? I choose them as real men, of my name. Jacques is my name, to whom the sight is likely to do good. Enough. You're English. That is another thing. Stay there, if you please, a little moment." With an admonitory gesture to keep them back, he stooped and looked in through the crevice in the wall. Soon raising his head again, he struck twice or thrice upon the door, evidently with no other object than to make a noise there. With the same intention, he drew the key across it three or four times, before he put it clumsily into the lock, and turned it as heavily as he could. The door slowly opened inward under his hand and he looked into the room and said something. A faint voice answered something. Little more than a single syllable could have been spoken on either side. He looked back over his shoulder and beckoned them to enter. Mr. Lorry got his arm securely round the daughter's waist and held her, for he felt that she was sinking. "'Ah! Uh, ah! Uh, business! Business!' he urged, with a moisture that was not of business shining upon his cheek. "'Come in, come in.' "'I am afraid of it,' she answered, shuddering. "'Of it? What? I mean of him, of my father.' Rendered in a manner desperate by her state, and by the beckoning of their conductor, he drew over his neck the arm that shook upon his shoulder, lifted her a little, and hurried her into the room. He set her down just within the door, and held her, clinging to him. Defarge drew out the key, closed the door, locked it on the inside, took out the key again, and held it in his hand. All this he did methodically, 
and with as loud and harsh an accompaniment of noise as he could make. Finally he walked across the room with a measured tread to where the window was. He stopped there and faced round. The garret, built to be a depository for firewood and the like, was dim and dark, for the window of dormer shape was in truth a door in the roof, with a little crane over it, for the hoisting up of stores from the street, unglazed and closing up the middle in two pieces like any other door of French construction. To exclude the cold, one half of this door was fast closed, and the other was opened but a very little way. Such a scanty portion of light was admitted through these means, that it was difficult on first coming in to see anything, and long habit alone could have slowly formed in any one the ability to do any work requiring nicety in such obscurity. Yet work of that kind was being done in the garret, for with his back to the door, and his face towards the window, where the keeper of the wine-shop stood looking at him, a white-haired man sat on a low bench, stooping forward, and very busy making shoes. End of Book One, Chapter Five This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens Book One Chapter Six The Shoemaker "'Good day,' said Monsieur Defarge, looking down at the white head that bent low over the shoemaking. It was raised for a moment, and a very faint voice responded to the salutation, as if it were at a distance. "'Good day.' "'You are still hard at work, I see.' After a long silence, the head was lifted for another moment, and the voice replied, "'Yes, I am working.' This time a pair of haggard eyes had looked at the questioner before the face had dropped again. The faintness of the voice was pitiable and dreadful. It was not the faintness of physical weakness, though confinement and hard fare no doubt had their part in it. Its deplorable peculiarity was that it was the faintness of solitude and disuse. It was like the last feeble echo of a sound made long and long ago. So entirely had it lost the life and resonance of the human voice that it affected the senses like a once beautiful color faded away into a poor, weak stain. So sunken and suppressed it was, that it was like a voice underground. So expressive it was, of a hopeless and lost creature, that a famished traveler, wearied out by lonely wandering in a wilderness, would have remembered home and friends in such a tone before lying down to die. Some minutes of silent work had passed, and the haggard eyes had looked up again, not with any interest or curiosity, but with the dull mechanical perception beforehand that the spot where the only visitor they were aware of had stood was not yet empty. "'I want,' said Defarge, who had not removed his gaze from the shoemaker, "'to let a little more light here. You can bear a little more.' The shoemaker stopped his work, looked with a vacant air of listening at the floor on one side of him, then similarly at the floor on the other side of him, then upward at the speaker. "'What did you say?' "'You can bear a little more light.' "'I must bear it if you let it in,' laying the palest shadow of a stress upon the second word. The open half-door was opened a little further, and secured at that angle for the time. A broad ray of light fell into the garret, and showed the workman with an unfinished shoe upon his lap, pausing in his labour. A few common tools and various scraps of leather were at his feet and on his bench. He had a white beard, raggedly cut, but not very long, a hollow face, and exceedingly bright eyes. The hollowness and thinness of his face would have caused them to look large under his yet dark eyebrows and his confused white hair, though they had really been otherwise. But they were naturally large, and looked unnaturally so. His yellow rags of shirt lay open at the throat, and showed his body to be withered and worn. He and his old canvas frock, and his loose stockings, and all his poor tatters of clothes, had, in a long seclusion from direct light and air, faded to such a dull uniformity of parchment yellow, that it would have been hard to say which was which. He had put up a hand between his eyes and the light, and the very bones of it seemed transparent. So he sat with a steadfastly vacant gaze, pausing in his work. He never looked at the figure before him, without first looking down on this side of himself, then on that, as if he had lost the habit of associating place with sound. 
He never spoke without first wandering in this manner and forgetting to speak. "'Are you going to finish that pair of shoes today?' asked Defarge, motioning to Mr. Lorry to come forward. "'What did you say?' "'Do you mean to finish that pair of shoes today?' "'I can't say that I mean to. I suppose so. I don't know.' But the question reminded him of his work, and he bent over it again. Mr. Lorry came silently forward, leaving the daughter by the door. When he had stood for a minute or two by the side of Defarge, the shoemaker looked up. He showed no surprise at seeing another figure, but the unsteady fingers of one of his hands strayed to his lips as he looked at it. His lips and his nails were of the same pale lead color. And then the hand dropped to his work, and he once more bent over the shoe. The look and the action had occupied but an instant. "'You have a visitor, you see,' said Mr. Defarge. "'What did you say?' "'Here is a visitor.' The shoemaker looked up as before, but without removing a hand from his work. "'Come,' said Defarge. "'Here is monsieur, who knows a well-made shoe when he sees one. Show him that shoe you are working at. Take it, monsieur.' Mr. Lorry took it in his hand. "'Tell monsieur what kind of shoe it is, and the maker's name.' There was a longer pause than usual, before the shoemaker replied, "'I forget what it was you asked me. What did you say?' "'I said—' "'Couldn't you describe the kind of shoe for monsieur's information?' "'It is a lady's shoe. It is a young lady's walking shoe. It is in the present mode. I, I never saw the mode. I have had a pattern in my hand.' He glanced at the shoe with some little passing touch of pride. "'And the maker's name?' said Defarge. Now that he had no work to hold, he laid the knuckles of the right hand in the hollow of the left and then the knuckles of the left hand in the hollow of the right, and passed a hand across his bearded chin, and so on, in regular changes, without a moment's intermission. The task of recalling him from the vagrancy into which he always sank when he had spoken was like recalling some very weak person from a swoon, or endeavouring, in the hope of some disclosure, to stay the spirit of a fast-dying man. "'Did you ask me for my name?' "'Assuredly I did.' One hundred and five North Tower. Is that all? One hundred and five North Tower. With a weary sound that was not a sigh nor a groan, he bent to work again, until the silence was again broken. "'You're not a shoemaker by trade,' said Mr. Lorry, looking steadfastly at him. His haggard eyes turned to Defarge as if he would have transferred the question to him, but as no help came from that quarter, they turned back on the questioner when they had sought the ground. "'I am not a shoemaker by trade?' "'No, I was not a shoemaker by trade. I—I I learnt it here. I, I taught myself. I asked leave to—' He lapsed away, even for minutes, wringing those measured changes on his hands the whole time. His eyes came slowly back, at last, to the face from which they had wandered. When they had rested on it, he started— and resumed, in the manner of a sleeper that moment awake, reverting to a subject of last night. I asked leave to teach myself, and I got it with much difficulty after a long while, and I have made shoes ever since. As he held out his hand for the shoe that had been taken from him, Mr. Lorry said, still looking steadfastly in his face, "'Monsieur Manette, do you remember nothing of me?' The shoe dropped to the ground, and he sat looking fixedly at the questioner. "'Monsieur Manette,' Mr. Lorry laid his hand upon Defarge's arm, "'do you remember nothing of this man? Look at him! Look at me! Is there no old banker, no old business, no old servant, no old time rising in your mind, Monsieur Manette?' As the captive of many years sat looking fixedly by turns at Mr. Lorry and at Defarge, some long obliterated marks of an actively intent intelligence in the middle of the forehead gradually forced themselves through the black mist that had fallen on him. They were overclouded again. They were fainter. They were gone. But they had been there. And so exactly was the expression repeated on the fair young face of her who had crept along the wall to a point where she could see him, and where she now stood looking at him, with hands which at first had been only raised 
in frightened compassion, if not even to keep him off and shut out the sight of him, but which were now extending towards him, trembling with eagerness to lay the spectral face upon her warm young breast, and love it back to life and hope. So exactly was the expression repeated, though in stronger characters, on her fair young face, that it looked as though it passed like a moving light from him to her. Darkness had fallen on him in its place. He looked at the two less and less attentively, and in his eyes in gloomy abstraction sought the ground and looked about him in the old way. Finally, with a deep, long sigh, he took the shoe up and resumed his work. "'Have you recognized it, monsieur?' asked Defarge in a whisper. "'Yes, for a moment. At first I thought it quite hopeless. But I have unquestionably seen, for a single moment, the face that I once knew so well. Hush, let us draw farther back. Hush!' She had moved from the wall of the garret, very near to the bench on which he sat. There was something awful in his unconsciousness of the figure that could have put out its hand and touched him as he stooped over his labour. Not a word was spoken, not a sound was made. She stood like a spirit beside him, and he bent over his work. It happened at length that he had occasion to change the instrument in his hand for his shoemaker's knife. It lay on that side of him which was not on the side on which she stood. He had taken it up and was stooping to work again when his eyes caught the skirt of her dress. He raised them and saw her face. The two spectators started forward, but she stayed them with the motion of her hand. She had no fear of his striking at her with the knife, though they had. He stared at her with a fearful look, and after a while his lips began to form some words, though no sound proceeded from them. By degrees, in the pauses of his quick and labored breathing, he was heard to say, What is this? With the tears streaming down her face, she put her two hands to her lips and kissed them to him then clasped them on her breast as if she laid his ruined head there. "'You are not the jailer's daughter?' She sighed, "'No. "'Who are you?' Not yet trusting the tones of her voice, she sat down on the bench beside him. He recoiled, but she laid her hand upon his arm. A strange thrill struck him when she did so, and visibly passed over his frame. He laid the knife down softly as he sat staring at her. Her golden hair, which she wore in long curls, had been hurriedly pushed aside and fell down over her neck. Advancing his hand by little and little, he took it up and looked at it. In the midst of the action he went astray and, with another deep sigh, fell to work at his shoemaking. But not for long. Releasing his arm, she laid her hand upon his shoulder. After looking doubtfully at it two or three times, as if to be sure that it was really there, he laid down his work, put his hand to his neck, and took off a blackened string with a scrap of folded rag attached to it. He opened this carefully on his knee, and it contained a very little quantity of hair, not more than one or two long golden hairs, which he had in some old day wound off upon his finger. He took her hair into his hand again and looked closely at it. It is the same. How can it be? When was it? How was it? As the concentrated expression returned to his forehead, he seemed to become conscious that it was in hers, too. He turned her full to the light and looked at her. She had laid her head upon my shoulder that night when I was summoned out. She had a fear of my going, though I had none. And when I was brought to the North Tower, they found these upon my sleeve. You will leave me, them. They can never help me to escape in the body, though they may in the spirit. Those were the words I said. I remember them very well. He formed this speech with his lips many times before he could utter it. But when he did find spoken words for it, they came to him coherently, though slowly. How was this? Was it you? Once more the two spectators started as he turned upon her with a frightful suddenness. But she sat perfectly still in his grasp and only said in a low voice, I entreat you, good gentlemen, do not come near us, do not speak, do not move. Hark! he exclaimed. Whose voice was that? His hands released her as he uttered this cry, and went up to his white hair, which they tore in a frenzy. It died out, as everything but his shoemaking did die out of him. 
and he refolded his little packet and tried to secure it in his breast. But he still looked at her and gloomily shook his head. No, no, no. You are too young, too blooming. It can't be. See what the prisoner is. These are not the hands she knew. This is not the face she knew. This is not a voice she ever heard. No, no. She was, and he was, before the slow years of the North Tower, ages ago. What is your name, my gentle angel? Hailing his softened tone and manner, his daughter fell upon her knees before him, with her appealing hands upon his breast. Oh, sir, at another time you shall know my name, and who my mother was, and who my father, and how I never knew their hard, hard history. But I cannot tell you at this time, and I cannot tell you here. All that I may tell you here and now is that I pray to you to touch me and bless me. Kiss me, kiss me, oh, my dear, my dear. His cold white head mingled with her radiant hair, which warmed and lighted it, as though it were the light of freedom shining on him. If you hear in my voice, and I don't know that it is so, but I hope it is, if you hear in my voice any resemblance to a voice that was once sweet music in your ears, weep for it, weep for it. If you touch, in touching my hair, anything that recalls a beloved head that lay on your breast when you were young and free, weep for it, weep for it. If, when I hint to you of a home that is before us, where I will be true to you with all my duty and, and with all my faithful service, I bring back the remembrance of a home long desolate, while your poor heart pined away, weep for it, weep for it. She held him closer round the neck and rocked him on her breast like a child. If, when I tell you, dearest dear, that your agony is over, and that I have come here to take you from it, and that we go to England to be at peace and at rest, I cause you to think of your useful life laid waste, and of our native France so wicked to you. Weep for it, weep for it. And if, when I shall tell you of my name, and of my father who is living, and of my mother who is dead, you learn that I have to kneel to my honored father, and implore his pardon for having never for his sake striven all day, and lain awake and wept all night, because the love of my poor mother hid his torture from me. Weep for it, weep for it. Weep for her, then, and for me. Good gentlemen, thank God. I feel his sacred tears upon my face, and his sobs strike against my heart. Oh, see, thank God for us, thank God. He had sunk in her arms, and his face dropped upon her breast. A sight so touching, yet so terrible, and the tremendous wrong and suffering which had gone before it, that the two beholders covered their faces. When the quiet of the garret had long been undisturbed, and his heaving breast and shaken form had long yielded to the calm that must follow all storms, emblem to humanity, of the rest and the silence into which the storm called life must hush at last, they came forward to raise the father and daughter from the ground. He had gradually dropped to the floor and lay there in a lethargy, worn out. She had nestled down with him, that his head might lie upon her arm, and her hair drooping over him curtained him from the light. If, without disturbing him, she said, raising her hand to Mr. Lorry as he stooped over them, after repeated blowings of his nose, all could be arranged for our leaving Paris at once, so that from the very door he could be taken away. But consider, is he fit for the journey? asked Mr. Lorry. More fit for that, I think, than to remain in this city so dreadful to him. It is true, said Defarge, who was kneeling to look on and hear. More than that, Monsieur Manette is, for all reasons, best out of France. Say, shall I hire a carriage and post-horses? That's business, said Mr. Lorry, resuming on the shortest notice his methodical manners. And if business is to be done, I had better do it. Then be so kind, urged Miss Manette, as to leave us here. You see how composed he has become, and you cannot be afraid to leave him with me now. Why should you be? If you will lock the door to secure us from interruption, I do not doubt that you will find him, when you come back, as quiet as you leave him. In any case, I will take care of him until you return. Then we will remove him straight. Both Mr. Lorry and Defarge were rather disinclined to this course, and in favour of one of them remaining. But as there were not only carriage and horses to be seen to, but travelling papers, and as time pressed, for the day was drawing to an end, it came at last to their hastily dividing the business that was necessary to be done, and hurrying away to do it. Then, as the darkness closed in, 
The daughter laid her head down upon the hard ground close at the father's side and watched him. The darkness deepened and deepened, and they both lay quiet until a light gleamed through the chinks in the wall. Mr. Lorry and Monsieur Defarge had made all ready for the journey, and had brought with them, besides travelling cloaks and papers, bread and meat, wine and hot coffee. Monsieur Defarge put this provender and the lamp he carried on the shoemaker's bench. There was nothing else in the garret but a pallet bed, and he and Mr. Lorry roused the captive and assisted him to his feet. No human intelligence could have read the mysteries in his mind, in the scared, blank wonder of his face. Whether he knew what had happened, whether he recollected what they had said to him, whether he knew that he was free, were questions no sagacity could have solved. They tried speaking to him, but he was so confused and so very slow to answer that they took fright at his bewilderment and agreed for the time to tamper with him no more. He had a wild, lost manner of occasionally clasping his head in his hands that had not been seen in him before, yet he had some pleasure in the mere sound of his daughter's voice and invariably turned to it when she spoke. In the submissive way of one long accustomed to obey under coercion, he ate and drank what they gave him to eat and drink, and put on the cloak and other wrappings that they gave him to wear. He readily responded to his daughter's drawing her arm through his, and took and kept her hand in both his own. They began to descend, Monsieur Defarge going first with the lamp, Mr. Lorry closing the little procession. They had not traversed many steps of the long main staircase when he stopped and stared at the roof and round at the walls. "'You remember the place, my father? You remember coming up here?' "'What did you say?' But before she could repeat the question, he murmured an answer as if she had repeated it. "'Remember? No, I don't remember. It was so very long ago.' That he had no recollection whatever of his having been brought from his prison to that house was apparent to them. They heard him mutter, "'One hundred and five North Tower.' and when he looked about him it was evidently for the strong fortress walls which had encompassed him. On their reaching the courtyard he instinctively altered his tread, as being in expectation of a drawbridge, and when there was no drawbridge, and he saw the carriage waiting in the open street, he dropped his daughter's hand and clasped his head again. No crowd was about the door, no people were discernible at any of the many windows, not even a chance passer-by was in the street, and a natural silence and desertion reigned there. Only one soul was to be seen, and that was Madame Defarge, who leaned against the doorpost, knitting, and saw nothing. The prisoner had got into a coach, and his daughter had followed him, when Mr. Lorry's feet were arrested on the step by his asking, miserably, for his shoemaking tools and the unfinished shoes. Madame Defarge immediately called to her husband that she would get them, and went, knitting, out of the lamplight through the courtyard. She quickly brought them down and handed them in, and immediately afterwards leaned against the doorpost, knitting, and saw nothing. Defarge got upon the box and gave the word, To the barrier! The postillion cracked his whip, and they clattered away under the feeble overswinging lamps. Under the overswinging lamps, swinging ever brighter in the better streets, and ever dimmer in the worse, and by lighted shops, gay crowds, illuminated coffee-houses and theatre doors to one of the city gates. Soldiers with lanterns at the guardhouse there, "'Your papers, travellers!' "'See here, then, monsieur the officer,' said Defarge, getting down and taking him gravely apart. "'These are the papers of monsieur inside, with the white head. They were consigned to me, with him, at the—' He dropped his voice. There was a flutter among the military lanterns, and one of them being handed into the coach by an arm in uniform. The eyes connected with the arm looked, not an every day or every night look, at monsieur with the white head. "'It is well. Forward!' from the uniform. Adieu, from Defarge. And so, under a short grove of feebler and feebler overswinging lamps, out under the great grove of stars. Beneath that arch of unmoved and eternal lights, some so remote from this little earth that the learned tell us it is doubtful whether their rays have even yet discovered it, as a point in space where anything is suffered or done, the shadows of the night were broad and black all through the cold and restless interval, until dawn, they once more whispered in the ears of Mr. Jarvis Lorry, sitting opposite the buried man who had been dug out, and wondering what subtle powers were forever lost to him, and what were capable of restoration, the old inquiry, I hope you care to be recalled to life, and the old answer, I can't say.
End of Book 1, Chapter 6 Recorded on February 17, 2006 by Jamie Osborne in El Paso, Texas.